Hey, everybody. Um, so when, uh, when it was first announced that this uh, event with Pam was going to happen, my friend Nicole, who some of you may know, Nicole Hardy, she called me up and, um, and she said, so, well, she kind of has this uh, valley girl sort of voice. So she's like, she's like, so, Pam Houston. And I was like, yeah. She's like, wow, like, no pressure. <laughs> I was like, yeah, right. She's like, I mean, like, no pressure to be awesome. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm a little intimidated, honestly. And she was like, yeah. <laughs> you should be. That is the only dialogue I am going to offer tonight. Um, can all be thankful. Um, but, uh, but there's a reason that we had that conversation. It's because we had, we had seen Pam at AWP and we'd both read her books and are huge fans. And, um, and it really is a great honor to be able to introduce her tonight and, and to be able to chat with her uh, after her talk. Um, when I think about Pam's dialogue, um, a quote from John Gardner comes to mind. And of course, anytime you're going to talk about the craft of prose writing, John Gardner is a good person to, to bring up. But he has this great quote at the start of um, The Art of the Novel, in which he says, art depends heavily on feeling, intuition, taste. It is feeling, not some rule, that gives the writer the rhythms of his sentences, the pattern of rise and fall in his episodes, the proportions of alternating elements, so that dialogue goes on only so long before a shift to description or narrative summary <clears throat> or some physical action. The great writer has an instinct for these things, he says. And I think that's such a great way of thinking about Pam Houston because she has such tremendous instincts and she changes up what she does with every book, with every story. There is this great sense of play about her work, but there's also a, a gem-like quality to each of her stories. Um, the way that she works with dialogue is thoroughly unique, and it's always changing, and um, we have a lot to learn from her tonight. So I'm really excited to introduce her. Pam Houston, her most recent book is Contents May Have Shifted, published in 2012. She's also the author of two collections of linked short stories, Cowboys Are My Weakness and Waltzing the Cat, and all awesome books, the novel Sight Hound, also great, and a collection of essays, A Little More About Me, all published by Norton. Her stories have been selected for volumes of Best American Short Stories, the O. Henry Awards, the 2013 Pushcart Prize, and Best American Short Stories of the Century. She's the winner of the Western State States Book Award, the Willa Award for Contemporary Fiction, the Evil Companions Literary Award, and multiple teaching awards. She's a professor of English uh, and an all-around great person. So put your hands together for Pam Houston. <laughs> Seattle's so great. <laughs> It really is, and so is Hugo House, and I am delighted to be here, and my belief in places like Hugo House gets only stronger as the university crumbles, and um, the, the university, um, and, uh, and so I, I, would, I would do anything that Hugo House asked me to do, which is why I'm here on a Friday night talking about dialogue. <laughs> um, the, the bigger question in my mind is why you are here <laughs> on a Friday night to hear me talk about dialogue. But, um, but this is how the world has become what it is. So, so we're just going to go for it. And I hope, I hope it's a little bit entertaining. Um, I did feel compelled to, you know, to say some true and in my opinion, important things about dialogue, in case there are some writers in the room, there probably are. Um, so, uh, so, I, so anyway, we're just gonna go for it and see how it goes. Um, dialogue. Some writers love it, some writers fear it, and all of us sometimes could ask, us, ask it to work harder than we do. The class I'm teaching here tomorrow on dialogue is subtitled, Playing tennis without a ball, or a racket, or a net, or a court, or a Serena Williams signature dress. <laughs> I called it that because one way I tend to think of dialogue 
is as a game of tennis between two not very good players. Each player has his own agenda to win, whatever that might mean in any particular scene. And because they bring their limited skill set to the court, rare are the moments when they are simply hitting the ball back and forth to each other gracefully. Even if the conflict is not obvious, even if the characters don't exactly know that they're having a conflict, dialogue is two agendas, however subtle, fighting for control of the scene. The first character keeps lobbing the ball over the second character's head and watching while he races back to get it, only to slash the ball back toward the net where it hits the top and dribbles ungracefully over to the other side. The game is anything but seamless, and all the while, the tension builds. The reader leans in to see who will emerge victorious. Let me begin with an example that I've been using in my classes for something like 15 years. It happens to be from real life, though real life is only sometimes and not always a good place to mind dialogue. And the fact that, but that is the way he said it in real life, is never a good enough excuse to use a line of dialogue in a story. As it happens, I have not written this bit of dialogue into a scene of any story. Even as it was happening, even right in the moment I was involved in this somewhat stressful conversation, I thought, I wish I had a tape recorder right now because this is an example of what I am always trying to tell my students about dialogue. <laughs> this conversation took place on a Saturday morning about 10 years ago in the now defunct Mucker's Bucket Bar in my hometown of Creed, Colorado. I didn't have a tape recorder, so I just memorized it and went home and wrote it down. But before I recite it, a bit of backstory. When I bought my 120-acre ranch outside of Creed in 1992, I was told before I moved in that the sheriff kept his 1958 Plymouth in my garage. <laughs> I, I was not told I could do anything about it, just that it was there, a condition of buying the ranch. I moved into the ranch pretty much out of a 1983 Toyota Corolla and a North Face VE24 tent where I had previously been living, so I didn't really need all that much storage space. I also figured it couldn't hurt in a town, a county of 475 souls, to have the sheriff owe me a favor. So I let Phil's car live there in my garage for nearly a decade, and he never once came to visit it. <laughs> During those years, though, I began to acquire things, as people do. A couple of 16-foot inflatable rafts, a 1964 Caribbean turquoise Ford pickup with three on the tree, a miter saw. And I thought it might be somebody else's turn to watch Phil's car. I called the sheriff's department a few times that summer, and Dolores, the dispatcher, said she would tell him. But a few months went by, and there the car sat, with four flat tires, I noticed, and leaking oil all over the concrete slab. My friend Christine happened to be visiting me from Portland that weekend, and we were in the Mucker's Bucket having lunch, chili cheeseburgers, when Phil walked in with his 10-gallon ga hat and his swagger, his side arms and side burns, <laughs> took one look at us and said to Christine, so little lady, did you get your problem all worked out? Christine said, hey, your car's in her garage. Yeah. Phil said, that's what they tell me. <laughs> he hitched his leg up onto the stool next to mine and gave me a quick once over. What's it been now, he said to me. Five, 10 years since I was carting you trying to get into the bars. I said, hi, Sheriff Leggett. My name is Pam Houston and I bought the Blair Ranch out on Middle Creek Road and your 58 Pontiac is in my garage. He said, aren't you gonna tell me if I even got close? I said, you were off by a few years, but I'll take it as a compliment. <laughs> he said, I think you're gonna find out that I was right in the end. And then he walked through the swinging doors back out into the bright afternoon. First, I want you to notice just how hard you were leaning in to try to figure out what the heck was going on in that dialogue. <laughs> And if you did manage to make sense of it, I'm hoping you got at least momentarily invested in whose agenda would win. That's the kind of attention that in an ideal world you want from your reader, always. Phil walked in and saw me, and we can assume all of a sudden remembered those messages dispatcher Doris, Dolores had passed along. 
Christine he had never seen before in his life. But he threw that line out there, did you get your problem all worked out, as a distraction. The little lady, of course, was deployed to make himself the big strong sheriff, which would make us the damsels in distress. And damsels in distress might need a big strong sheriff one day and maybe ought not to give him too hard a time about his tardiness in picking up his car. See all that packed into one line, 10 words of dialogue. But Christine is on to him, and she comes right back with her hey, and all, and all, that, word impl all that word implies. Hey, why are you fucking with us? Hey, why don't you save that weak little lady shit for someone who likes that kind of thing, and let's instead talk about the real subject here, which is your car. <laughs> Phil's That's What They Tell Me is a wonderful cocktail of acknowledgment, evasion, and dismissal. <laughs> He's going to acknowledge that Christine has actually spoken, which is more than he will do with me later. But we never get to the next step, the part where he apologizes and says he'll come pick up the car. Christine may as well have said 24 inches of snow were in the forecast or a herd of cow elk came through the bar door. That's what they tell me. And now that Phil has seen that Christine isn't the pushover he expected her to be, he turns to me. What's it been now? five, ten years since I was carding you trying to get into the bars. There's the father figure again, the paternal savior. Never mind that I didn't move to Creed until I was 32. N <laughs> never mind that the Creed bars are for skanks. <laughs> you see what he's doing here, another distraction, this time with a little compliment thrown in. I was nearly 40 when this conversation took place. <laughs> Good old Phil keeping the peace and looking out for my safety. My comeback tries to change the terms of the conversation. Hi, Sheriff Leggett. My name is Pam Houston, and I bought the Blair Ranch on Middle Creek Road, and your 58 Pontiac is in my garage, i.e., I am not the little girl you are mistaking me for. I was never some underage bar rat, at least not in this town, and furthermore, I bought with my own money a 120-acre ranch for fuck's sake. I am a 40-year-old woman who is gainfully employed, who knows the difference between a 58 Pontiac and a 62 Ford, and I don't need a daddy to protect me. I just need some space in my garage, so if I want to, I can go out and use my miter saw to cut up large pieces of wood. <laughs> But all of that is lost on Phil, <laughs> or else he is very, very good at pretending. He goes straight back to his agenda. Aren't you going to tell me if I even got close? Which turns out to be pretty much game, set, match. It's his town, his bar full of people that have elected him something like 16 times, avoiding term limits by changing his middle name, which... <laughs> which nobody questioned because nearly everyone in Creed is either a legate or a hustle cuss. That's true. <laughs> you are off by a few years, but I'll take it as a compliment, I say, wiping my neck with a towel as he hosts the big gold Wimbledon plate high into the air. I think you'll find out, he says, rubbing it in, smirking for the paparazzi that I was right in the end. I am not exactly suggesting to you that all of your dialogue ought to be like this one, so far out on the edge of comprehension. <laughs> I just want you to notice how many subtle clues those few lines revealed about the characters in the scene and the tension between them. There's a story Steve Allman tells about asking one of his teachers at a writer's conference, how am I supposed to know what to cut? And the teacher quoting Bertolt Brecht back to him saying, ask yourself, what work does it do? What work does every sentence do, asked the young Steve. Every word, the teacher said. It's amazing to me the way students of writing use words as if they were free, as if you are not spending, really wasting, your reader's good faith interest with every word that isn't earning its keep in your story. It's probably a good rule of thumb that every word in your story or novel ought to be doing at least two, if not three things at one time. This is especially true in dialogue which ought to be some of the hardest working words in the whole story. The two kinds of work dialogue was made for and is best at, as we have seen in the scene above, are creating tension and revealing character. It is also good at revealing the true nature 
of the relationship between the two people who are talking, which, if you think about it, is a combination of both of those things. The character's character and the various tensions, don't forget love and attraction are tensions too, that exist now or have existed in the past between them. Let's take a look at this scene from Claire Vey Watkins' stellar 2012 collection of short stories, Battleborn. This is from a story called The Archivist. I don't really have to tell you anything about this scene because the dialogue is working so hard to reveal everything you need to know. But since it comes more than halfway through the story, I will tell you that the scene is between Carly and the narrator, whose name is Natalie, and that they are sisters. Carly's husband is named Alex, and Carly's baby is named The Miracle. The, na the narrator is unexpectedly pregnant and has begun calling her unborn child Cranberry. Everything else, and in a way, even those things, is revealed through this superb dialogue. Carly knelt on the floor beside the tub. She put her hand on my arm. You don't have to do this alone, she said. Alex and I could help you. Cranberry and the miracle could be friends. It could be like when we were kids, before things got bad. I said, things were always bad. They weren't, Carly said. You were too young, but they weren't. Why are you defending her? The miracle screeched. I'm not. Carly stood and lifted her daughter, holding her like a shield. It's just, do you have to be so hard on everyone? I don't know, probably. The miracle took her mother's earring into her mouth. Carly extracted it gingerly. You make him sound like some sort of flim-flam man. That's what he is, Carr, a flim-flam man. Come on. No, that's exactly what he is, a flim-flam man with a nice laugh, a cokehead flim-flam man who left me with a nicotine addiction and some trash from his pockets. Tell me a baby's going to change that. The miracle clapped her hands on the earring and said, all right. You're never going to feel ready for this, Nat. They make you ready. What if they don't? What if I have it, and the only difference is I think I'm going down and I'm taking this kid with me? She winced. It won't be like that. I couldn't help myself. It was like that for us. After some time, she said, you're right. The first thing to notice about this scene is how it reveals character, how much we learn about both sisters in just these few lines. The next thing to notice is how well it articulates the conflict between them. This is not a conflict in the simplest sense. Carly loves Natalie, wants only the best for her, but Carly's agenda is to make Natalie see that she is strong enough to have the baby, and Natalie's agenda is to make Carly see that she's not. But to say that, to explicate the scene in this simplistic way, does it a grave injustice. Because in fact, Carly and Natalie's agenda, agendas are much more complicated than that, and all twisted around each other like red licorice. And we could feel those things better before I started to talk about them. And that is why dialogue can be such a better place to create tension than exposition, because dialogue lets things be as very, very complicated as they often are without trying to sort them out using our big analytical brains. In the end of this scene, and I think unexpectedly, it is Carly who throws in the towel and Natalie who hoists the big gold Wimbledon trophy. Another thing to notice are how powerful the few words of exposition that exist in this scene between the lines of dialogue are, which is the other thing we are talking about when we talk about dialogue, how the conversation dances with the small details that a scene made primarily of dialogue surrounds. In this case, the one that pops is, Carly stood and lifted her daughter, holding her like a shield. It's so rich, it's almost over the top. These sisters love each other clearly, and yet how many undercurrents are suggested in that line that reaches all the way back into the past to all the things she is using the miracle to shield herself from? The bad past and Natalie's unrelenting happiness and the way it demands that Carly think about the bad past, that she is afraid might infect her, might make her say uncle, might make her think for a minute that she will wreck the miracle's life too. And here, once again, I'm kind of wrecking the beauty of the story with my explanation of it creates tension and reveals character. Check and check. What else? The passage suggests, without exactly explicating, backstory. This is an important distinction. Dialogue can become quite ham-fisted when it works too hard to reveal backstory. 
if Natalie had said to Carly, you remember, Carly, how it was in our childhood in 1989 in the Nevada <laughs> desert when mom started drinking again and she had to drive 65 miles to Pahrump to the nearest AA meeting, but our stepdad had run off, so there was never enough money for gas, so she turned in desperation back to the bottle. We do learn a version of these things elsewhere in the story, but in exposition, which is a better place for it, especially when you have two characters who live the same past, in this case, sisters. If they can bear to speak of the past at all, a past which they will nearly always remember differently, they will speak about it only in a kind of a code. Every relationship has a code built into it, and great dialogue honors these codes. You speak differently to your parents than you do to your lover, than you do to your best girlfriend, than you do to your boss, than you do to the guy at the quick lube, than you do to your teacher, than you do to your priest. And within those codes are a million variations depending on the individuals who are speaking. In the same way dialogue sometimes accidentally reveals backstory, it also sometimes accidentally advances the plot. But if it is working too hard to advance the plot, you have a similar problem as when you try to cram it full of backstory and it's not long until you start sounding like an episode of bad TV, as in, to the Batmobile, Robin, or you mean back to the Batcave to use the Bat computer to discover the Riddler's whereabouts? <laughs> or, there's not time for that, Robin. We'll use the portable Bat computer in the Batmobile to try to find the Riddler before he destroys all of Gotham City. <laughs> Holy modern technology, Batman, and so on. <laughs> Those are all actual. <laughs> I looked them up. <laughs> Dialogue, likewise, is not great for providing a recap of the action that has just occurred, as also from Batman and also actual, and this is my favorite. Robin, haven't you noticed how we always escape the viscous ensnarements of our enemies? <laughs> Here's another happy thing to acknowledge about dialogue. You're in bed reading, you're sleepy, but you want to get to the end of the chapter, so you look ahead to see how far it is to the break. And as you do, the pages with lots of dialogue make you smile. Yeah. Don't deny it. <laughs> when I am reading a book with giant rectangles of text filling every page, <laughs> unless the writing is just drop-dead sensational, I feel a little exhausted and a lot closed out, not invited physically into the story. Passages of dialogue literally give the reader a place to be within the story. Not just, sorry, a place to sit on the page in all that merciful white space. Dialogue allows us to enter the story not just spatially, but also temporally. Almost always, though not in every single case, when we get to a big chunk of dialogue, story time has slowed down to its actual speed. The story is moving at the speed of dialogue. The summarizing has ceased, and the narrator, whoever she is, has stopped doing what I call throwing her body between the story and the reader. <laughs> she has stopped being the interpreter of the scene, a contextualizer of emotional stakes within the scene, and has become, for a few moments, simply a recording device, just telling it like it is. And even though in our writers' minds we know that this is not essentially true, that a writer can manipulate us just as well, if not better, in dialogue than she can when we see quite clearly that she, she is throwing her body between us and the text. In dialogue, it feels to the reader like she has stopped and that the reader is free to interpret the action directly. I like very much the feeling that I am participating in the interpretive act of reading a story. I like believing that I have discovered the story under the story, that I have been smart enough to pick up on the subtle clues. Nothing makes me want to hurl a book across a room harder and faster than when the writer gives me a quick little emotional recap to make sure I'm keeping up. <laughs> For this reason, I try very hard when I am writing dialogue not to let it try to emotionally contextualize itself from within or from without, either in the moments that lead up to it or in the attributive clause that he said, she said, or in the dialogue itself. Shut the fuck up, Janie screeched angrily in response to Josh's constant complaining about her cooking, the over-controlling way he stood in the kitchen watching her every move. Josh, 
I know getting let go at the bank has fired up all of your insecurities and made you want to lash out at the person closest to you, but it's not okay to try to make yourself feel better by criticizing me. In this kind of dialogue, the reader may as well go outside and have a cigarette because all of the work here has already been done for him. I should tell you how long it took me to write those lines. <laughs> because even as I was typing them for the first time, I kept trying to fix them as I went. <laughs> My fingers kept wanting to make the general specific or to find an object to stand in for an abstraction and to cut and cut and cut, and I had to force myself not to. It made me wonder if I ought to have my students write badly on purpose so that they could see when they, you know. It was really an interesting exercise. <sighs> but that's the subject for another day. For now, <laughs> Listen to how free from emotional contextualization is this scene from Amy Hempel's In the Cemetery Where Al Jolson is Buried. And these are the story's first lines. So when I say no contextualization, I really mean it. Feel yourself leaning in. Tell me things I won't mind forgetting, she said. Make it useless stuff or skip it. I began. I told her insects fly through rain, missing every drop, never getting wet. I told her no one in America owned a tape recorder before Bing Crosby did. I told her the shape of the moon is like a banana. You see it looking full, you're seeing it end on. The camera made me self-conscious and I stopped. It was trained on us from a ceiling mount, the kind of camera banks use to photograph robbers. It played us to the nurses down the hall in intensive care. Go on, girl, she said. You get used to it. I had my audience. I went on. Did she know that Tammy Wynette had changed her tune? Really? That now she sings Stand By Your Friends? That Paul Anka did it too? Does you're having, a, does you're having our baby now? Sorry, <laughs> sorry, messed it up. Let me start over. I had my audience. I went on. Did she know that Tammy Wynette had changed her tune? Really, that now she sings Stand By Your Friends, that Paul Anka did it too, does You're Having Our Baby, that he got sick of all that feminist bitching. What else, she said, have you got something else? Oh yes, for her I would always have something else. Did you know that when they taught the first chimp to talk it lied? that when they asked her who did it on the desk, she signed back the name of the janitor, <laughs> and that when they pressed her, she said she was sorry that it was really the project director, <laughs> but she was a mother, so I guess she had her reasons. Oh, that's good, she said, a parable. There's more about the chimp, I said, but it will break your heart. No thanks, she said, and scratches at her mask. If you know that story, and if you don't, you should, you will recognize how hard this dialogue is working. To reveal character and build tension, sure, but also to set up the central metaphors, the threads that will weave themselves together and make what is a brief and very spare story not only cohere, but be profoundly affecting. We wait the whole length of the story to find out the heartbreaking thing about the chimp. But by that point, our hearts will have been already broken repeatedly. And the line from this passage that will stay with us the most is, for her, I would always have something else, because that is the one promise that the narrator cannot keep. Dialogue is also often an opportunity for humor in an otherwise serious story like the above, or sometimes even in an otherwise funny story. And one thing about funny is that funny is almost always fast. No one likes a belabored joke. And since exposition has many, many more opportunities for belaborment than dialogue does, dialogue can be a good place to be funny. Consider this brief section from my recent novel, Contents May Have Shifted. This morning at Ruby's house, the kids are playing Would You Rather? And Marla, whose weight is currently at the bottom of her 50-pound cycle and is therefore all cleavage and ponytail, says, Pam, would you rather look like you do now forever or get wise? <laughs> get wise, I say. No brainer. What if you could look like you looked when you were 25 forever? Same answer, I said. And Marla narrows her eyes. 
Rick always says, you are so beautiful on the inside, except when he says, you are so beautiful when I'm inside you, which Cinder tells me is even worse. <laughs> well, says Marla, what if you could have all the wisdom of a lifetime and still look like you looked when you were 25? Or what, I say. <laughs> what, what, she says. <laughs> I say, I thought we were playing Would You Rather. She twists her head like a dog at a foghorn. <laughs> Marla, I say, you get the wisdom because you don't look like you did anymore <laughs> when you were 25. <laughs> she says, you don't understand the rules to this game. <laughs> the next passage I'm going to read you is a relative rarity in the great Toni Morrison's work, a passage from jazz that is almost exclusively dialogue with no exposition mixed in. The main storyline in jazz concerns Violet and Joe, who are married to each other. Joe has an affair with a girl named Dorcas, who he then kills apparently because he loves her too much. This is a conversation between Violet and Dorcas's aunt, Alice Manfred, who is a seamstress after Dorcas's death. There's no exposition to illuminate or underscore or provide a background through which to hear this dialogue. And yet listen to how nuanced it is, how much it suggests about the characters and also how their level of irritation and understanding of each other ebbs and flows throughout the scene the two of them changing positions with nearly every line. Another time, Violet said to Alice Manfred, another time I would have loved her too, just like you did, just like Joe. She was holding her coat's lapels closed, too embarrassed to let her hostess hang it up lest she see the lining. Maybe, said Alice, maybe. You'll never know that now though, will you? I thought she was going to be pretty, Violet said, real pretty. She wasn't. Pretty enough, I'd say. You mean the hair, the skin color. Don't tell me what I mean. Then what? What he see in her? Shame on you, grown woman like you asking me that. I have to know. Then ask the one who does know. You see him every day. Don't get mad. Will if I want to. All right, but I don't want to ask Joe. I don't want to hear what he has to say about it. You know what I'm asking. Forgiveness is what you're asking, and I can't give you that. It's not in my power. No, not that. That's not it, forgiveness. What then? Don't get pitiful. I won't stand for you getting pitiful. You hear me? We born around the same time, me and you, said Violet. We women, me and you. Tell me something real. Don't just say I'm grown and ought to know. I don't. I'm 50 and I don't know nothing. What about it? Do I stay with him? I want to, I think. I want, well, I didn't always. Now I want. I want some fat in this life. Wake up. Fat or lean, you got just one. This is it. You don't know either, do you? I know enough to know how to behave. Is that all? Is that all it is? Is that all what is? Oh, shoot. Where are the grown people? Is it us? <laughs> Isn't that fantastic? <sighs> Did you notice how few attributive clauses there were there? It almost seems like there weren't any, but if you look closely at that scene, and the scene from All the Pretty Horses that I'll read in a sec, you'll see that there are just enough attributive clauses to keep track of who's speaking. And the ones that are there nearly disappear. This is just a little scene from All the Pretty Horses. The waitress brought their coffee. Here you go, doll, she said. I'll have your all's orders up in just a minute. She's gone to San Antonio, the boy said. Don't call her she. Mama, I know it. They drank their coffee. What he aimed to do? About what? About anything. She can go where she wants to. The boy watched him. You ain't got no business smoking them things, he said. His father pursed his lips and drummed his fingers on the table and looked up. When I come around asking you what I'm supposed to do, you'll know you're big enough to tell me, he said. 
Yes, sir. You need any money? No. He watched the boy. You'll be all right, he said. The waitress brought their dinner, thick china lunch plates with steak and gravy and potatoes and beans. I'll get your all's bread. His father tucked his napkin into his shirt. It ain't me I was worried about, the boy said. Can I say that? His father took up his knife and cut into the steak. Yeah, he said, you can say that. There are only five dialogue attributions in that long string of dialogue. People say that Cormac doesn't ever use them, but as you can see here, it's not true. Because he sticks to a simple he said and she said, and because he uses them only when absolutely necessary, our brains register the he saids and she saids almost automatically without giving those words the same attention that we give the other words on the page. I told you so, she chortled knowingly. On the other hand, we'll get a reader's attention every time and not in a good way. <laughs> Likewise, she breathed sexily, she screamed piercily, she whined annoyingly. <laughs> I'm known at the various places I teach for saying there are no rules in creative writing. And if one of my students come to me with some rule another teacher has articulated, Stories in the second person can't work, for instance. I will rather annoyingly go to some lengths to present said student with examples by Italo Calvino, William Faulkner, Margaret Atwood, Laurie Moore. But this is the closest thing to a rule you will ever get out of me. If you feel the urge to use an adverb in a dialogue attribution, think again. <laughs> I use more he saids and she saids than Cormac McCarthy. Most people do. Because I find them really useful rhythmically. Because they don't really have the same weight on the page as the other words in the sentence. Great dialogue read aloud can sound almost like music, with the he saids and the she saids becoming the downbeat in the song. As in this scene from my novel, Contents May Have Shifted. My students here blink at me like sweet, stubborn calves. I stand in front of the classroom and think, don't talk about religion, don't talk about religion. So every example I come, with has got, come up with has God in it somewhere. <laughs> I am talking to them about the importance of listening to the sounds of words, how you can hear the sound of a word more clearly when you don't know what it means. For example, I say, I overheard this phrase last night at the barbecue place, 15 naked Pentecostals from Floydata. I don't know what those words mean. <laughs> and Travis says, sure you do. And I say, no, I don't. And he says, well, Floydata is a town. And I say, OK. And he says, you know what Pentecostal means. And I say, no, I honestly don't. And Reagan, the one with straight black bangs that go all the way to her eyelashes, the one who wrote a story about a Muslim named Salim who shot his sister through the breast because he found out she had welcomed Jesus into her heart, says quietly, and without a hint of irony, Pentecostal means everything but the snakes. <laughs> a dialogue talk would not be complete without reminding you that every bit as important as what your characters say are all the things your characters don't say, what they avoid saying. If we read just a little further into that Cormac McCarthy scene in the diner, you can feel how the tension gets ratcheted up by the shorthand they are trying to maintain with each other and the game of chicken they are playing to see who will talk about the absent mother first. You can say whatever's on your mind. Hell, you can bitch at me about smoking if you want. The boy didn't answer. You know it ain't what I wanted, don't you? Yeah, I know that. You looking after Roscoe good? He ain't been rode. Why don't we go Saturday? All right. You don't have to go if you got something else to do. I ain't got nothing else to do. His father smoked. He watched him. You don't have to if you don't want to, he said. I want to. Can you and Arturo load and pick me up in town? Yeah. What time? What time you'll be up? I'll get up. We'll be there at 8. I'll be up. The boy nodded. He ate. His father looked around. I wonder who you need to see in this place to get some coffee, he said. The boy said, what do you think I should do? I don't think there's much you can do. Will you talk to her? I can't talk to her. You could talk to her. Last conversation we had was in San Diego, California in 1942. It ain't her fault. I ain't the same as I was. 
I'd like to think I am, but I ain't. You are inside, the boy said. Inside you are. His father coughed. He drank from his cup. Inside, he said. They sat for a long time. She's in a play or something over there. Yeah, I know it. The boy reached and got his hat off the floor and put it on his knee. I better get back, he said. You know I thought the world of that old man, don't you? The boy looked out the window. Yeah, he said. Don't go to crying on me now. I ain't. Well, don't. He never give up, the boy said. He was the one told me not to. He said, let's not have a funeral till we got something to bury. If it ain't nothing but his dog tags, they were fixing to give your clothes away. His father smiled. They might as well have, he said. Only thing that fit me was the boots. He always thought you all would get back together. Yeah, I know he did. The boy stood and put his hat on. I better get back, he said. He used to get in fights over her, even as an old man. Anybody said anything about her? I better get on, the boy said. Well, he unpropped his feet from the windowsill. I'll walk down with you. I need to get the paper. They stood in the tiled lobby while his father scanned the headlines. How can Shirley Temple be getting divorced, he said. <laughs> he looked up. Early winter twilight in the streets. I might just get a haircut, he said. He looked at the boy. I know how you feel, son. I felt the same way. It's a lot of work to get to that one little sliver of empathy, <laughs> but that's Cormac for you. <laughs> um, I'd like to finish up my talk with just a little scene that I wrote recently um, after a plane ride, during which I was handed some great dialogue by my seatmate. <laughs> um, it's part of a triptych, three panels that together make a story, but I'm only going to read the first panel. And um, the challenge of this scene, I, I was given the dialogue, literally, and it was just to see what to put around it to make it work best. So this is in a story called Maggie on the Road, and this is one, section one, called Clear Air Turbulence. It was a CRJ 300, the little jet where even reasonably sized people spend the two and a half hours between San Francisco and Tucson bumped up against each other at the shoulder, the elbow, and the knee. Maggie couldn't bring herself to do actual work in a space where she couldn't straighten her arms or legs, but once they reached their cruising altitude, she decided to distract herself by editing her Mongolia photos. The trip had been her 50th birthday present to herself, a lifelong dream, the temples, the steppes, Karakoram, the Gobi Desert, that her Mongolian guide was an undiagnosed borderline schizophrenic and such a compulsive liar that at one point, Maggie became convinced he was not even really Mongolian, <laughs> was a small black mark on an otherwise satisfying trip. If he is not, in fact, an American misogynist, she wrote on several postcards of a yak-cow hybrid, that the Mongolians delightfully call a kanag, which translates roughly to an every once in a while. He certainly came to the States to receive his training. But the physicality of the place was magnificent, the nomadic culture more or less intact, and Maggie had taken 3,000 photos in 21 days, which now sat in her hard drive waiting to be futzed with. Her seatmate on the commuter plane had smiled so broadly at Maggie upon her arrival that Maggie thought they must be acquainted. Maggie was always bumping into former patients on airplanes, though not often, thank God, current ones. But this woman, who wore the aspect of a large, eager bird, an ostrich, Maggie thought, or a dodo, <laughs> turned out to be simply friendly, the sort of friendly that made Maggie, and she hated to admit this, instantly suspicious. <laughs> Where's that, the woman said before Maggie had even selected her first thumbnail to enlarge. Mongolia, Maggie said. I was there for the whole month of July. Mongolia, the woman said. Incredible. I am so fascinated by Mongolia. I saw it, you know, on the amazing race. <laughs> Maggie didn't know the amazing race, but she got the gist of it. Another thing about 50, she thought, is that it was okay now to get the gist of things and leave it at that. <laughs> TV was one of those. Systems analysis, another. 
There were entire categories of professions, Maggie realized, where she had only the vaguest notion of what people actually did. <laughs> Until only recently, when Maggie heard the words Silicon Valley, she didn't realize it referred to actual towns she knew the names of, San Mateo, San Carlos, Palo Alto, and had pictured instead a series of low slung gray buildings nestled somewhere in the green hills of Santa Clara County, like Neverland or Santa's Workshop, <laughs> buildings full of tiny people making things with very small tools. <laughs> Is that a temple, the woman asked? Gandanchalin Monastery, Maggie answered, in Ulan Bator, one of the few the Russians left standing. Isn't that something? Beautiful, Maggie said, and very alive in there, monks chanting in the different temples all hours of the day. Is that a cave painting of a deer? The woman pointed to another thumbnail. Ibex, I think, Maggie said. We saw some living ones, too. And so the miles fell under the wing of the plane, Maggie describing the Bronze Age petroglyphs at Babagan Nuru, the flaming cliffs at Abnab, the wild, short-legged, and handsome Przewalski horses, descendants of an ancient breed. The woman's enthusiasm was nothing if not genuine, and eventually Maggie's mild irritation turned to an equally tepid gratitude. Really, had any of her friends been this excited to hear about her trip? <laughs> the plane bounced sharply once without preamble. Clear air turbulence, she'd been told that was called. And look at this, Maggie said, a dinosaur spine twice as long as I am just laying on top of the sand. Really, the woman said, leaning hard over Maggie's arm to see the dun-colored calcified bones stretching like a long tail across the whiter calcified soil. We drove for three days to get to this place, Maggie said, and then spines, femurs, you wouldn't have believed it. Vertebrae so large it took both hands to hold just one. It's all so hard to fathom, 39 million years. 39 million years, the woman said. And Maggie, hypervigilant as ever, missed neither the slight tonal change nor the slight shifts of, shift of the woman's energy back to her side of the skimpy armrest. 39 million years? Fucking shit, Maggie thought. <laughs> her mind cornering hard to keep up with the conversation, not knowing the precise nature of blasphemy she had spoken, not knowing even really what her own side of the argument was. <laughs> Where was Jonathan, her recovering Southern Baptist sometimes boyfriend when she needed him? It would make his whole week to take a piece out of this woman's hide. <laughs> well, Maggie mumbled, that's what the guide said. <laughs> the woman sniffed. She actually sniffed, thought Maggie, like somebody in a Henry James novel. <laughs> so what is it that you think exactly, the woman said. Those dinosaurs just whirled up out of the dust? You had to marvel at the transformation. The woman's eyes, which had been just a few minutes before so bright and interested, were angry slits now registering nothing but condemnation, the mouth aged a full 10 years. You should see your face right now, Maggie thought, but said, didn't they uh, crawl out of the ocean? <laughs> she realized she had not the slightest idea when people like this woman thought it had all started. There was Jesus, of course, and year zero, but surely Adam and Eve would have had to have gotten a pretty good head start on him. <laughs> Well, said the woman, who was leaning so far away from Maggie now, the flight attendant was having trouble getting the beverage cart around her. <laughs> I'd like to think they were created. She drew the word out like another woman might say, Manolo Blahnik. <laughs> the world wore you out, Maggie thought, if you let it. Just that morning, she had read that the Koch brothers were poised to buy the Chicago Tribune. She looked out the window. The Grand Canyon was a bright red gash below her. There was not one single cloud in the desert sky. The plane shuddered again, and the pilot accelerated to a smoother altitude. There was a way, 
Maggie thought, to open your heart to everyone. Only she hadn't found it yet. <laughs> I don't have any problem with the word created, she said and pulled up a photo of traditional Mongolian dance. Thank you. The idea of, of um, you know, every rule can be refuted by some writer who's done it differently. Mm -hmm. um, as we talked about earlier, I don't have an MFA. I've barely taken a creative writing class, so I always have this sort of insecurity about um, not knowing what the rules are. Uh, so I find that sort of thing very relieving. Um, so I want to kind of jump directly to one of the rules that everybody talks about. Um, and you mentioned, and I'm so glad that you did, because this is something Elmore Leonard has talked about, Stephen King has talked about, the idea of using adverbs uh -huh. in, um, in dialogue. And um, so Tomas, can you give me number six? We're going to show you some, some excerpts up on this here screen. If, any, if anybody wants to move over, too, feel free, if, if you're having a hard time seeing over there. So this is from the dead, from the Dubliners, <laughs> before James Joyce uh, went all wackadoo <laughs> with his later stuff. So I'd love for you to kind of take a look at this and let me know, what do you think about it? As you'll notice, there, there are mm -hmm. quite a few. Um, do you want me to read it out loud, or you want to? Uh, not yeah? very much. <laughs> OK. And do you mean to say, asked Mr. Brown incredulously, that a chap can go down there and put up there as if it were a hotel and live on the fat of the land and then come away without paying anything? Oh, most people give some donation to the monastery when they leave, said Mary Jane. I wish we had an institution like that in our church, said Mr. Brown candidly. He was astonished to hear that the monks never spoke, got up at two in the morning and slept in their coffins. He asked what they did it for. That's the rule of the order, said Aunt Kate. Firmly. <laughs> so what do you think? Does it work? Well, what I thought was that someone tomorrow in class was going to bring me an example of adverbs in great literature in dialogue attributions, but it See, happened even time. quicker. Oh, than sorry. That. <laughs> um, well, I mean, you know, I'd say a couple things about it. I would say, you know, that this was written in 19... 08 or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we had a different aesthetic sense then. Um, uh, I would also say that maybe that this this was James Joyce's first book, and mm -hmm. maybe rather than going all wackadoo, he actually got <laughs> smarter and um, and started taking them out uh, in Ulysses. I don't believe there are adverbs in the dialogue in Ulysses, which I just listened to on CD. It's 41 CDs. It took me a year and a half, oh, but wow. but uh, it's really astonishing. I mean, it's much better than this, but I, but I, um, but I couldn't, you know, I, I couldn't say for sure that there weren't any dialogue attributions with adverbs in it. Um, I, I do think our aesthetic taste has changed about this thing, mm -hmm. um, but you know, I, I, I would, I mean, I think this would be better without them, uh, <laughs> you know. But but I'm bringing my 2013 aesthetic sense to right. something that was written more than 100 years ago, so. So I don't know, you know, I, I, I guess, I guess it's to, it speaks to the larger point, which is that, I mean, I, what I could imagine better in 2014 than looking at this would be some experimental piece of prose that did it in a totally arch way and made me laugh while doing it. I mean, right. that's the thing I immediately think of, like Donald Barthelme, or, or you know, whoever the, the right now Donald Barthelme is, right. could, could use adverbs hilariously you know, right. by... <laughs> right, in an almost meta sort exactly. of way. Just like that. In a meta story way right. and make it work. Right. Which is really to the larger point about rules, right? That, 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 there, aren't, that there aren't any. Right. And, uh, and, and we, um, we had a little conversation about whether I was going to put the, the text that I uh, brought with me uh, those, you know, the piece from Battleborn and the piece from Jazz and all that up on the screen during the talk, and and I didn't want to um, because I because I'm I, because I'm I'm afraid that PowerPoint might be the death of art, you know. But I mean, just <laughs> like not to put too fine a point on it, but but that's the that's the best way I can offer that up in shorthand. Like I, 
But, but that really speaks to a, a, a bigger point, which, which I think is the most important point. I mean, all of my crap talks in one way or another get around to saying, you know, but this is just my bullshit. Like, this is just what I'm thinking on this particular day. Right. And, and that, you know, that we love writing, and this is really the important part. We love art, okay, but in this room, we love writing b because it doesn't have any rules. If there were rules, like if you could pay $28,000, and get an MFA, and it was like learning to become a BMW mechanic, and then you could get under the BMW and change the carburetor. Like, but that's not that's not what it is. And 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 I feel like I want to keep reminding people of that 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 anything is possible in writing, and and that's why we're in this lifelong infatuation with it. We were just talking at the break about how I just started writing in the third person. It's hilarious. I mean. Everyone's giving me, giving me a hard time all my life for only writing in the first and second person. And then Maggie popped up, and there she is in the third person. And, and she's great. She, she's a clinical psychologist in a maximum security prison. And so she has a credential. Like, she can say whatever the hell she wants, because like, she saw Ted Kaczynski be cool. brought into you know, the prison in Colorado. So anyway, like, uh, and who knew? Like, th there was this the third person. you know, And, and it took me, like, 52 years to get to the third person. And I probably won't stay there, but it's it, but that's the thing about writing. Like it's always new. There's always some new challenge. And um, you know, and I, I teach in two M MFA programs. I have made my living um, doing it, and I do believe that I have a role. I believe that I can put really the right book in front of someone who's struggling with a particular thing. I believe that I can s talk about my own experience writing that might make it so that student comes up against something and, and says, oh, well, remember Pam said that thing about, or whoever the teacher is. Like, I don't believe they are useless, but I, but I do believe that to confuse that sort of program with a set of, a, a set of skills and rules that you can learn and then be a writer is a dangerous game. And somehow mm -hmm. PowerPoint, represents that to me. <laughs> it's like PowerPoint is the physical manifestation of that in the world. Right. Though I have learned to do it recently. I, I've made m several major life decisions because of my fear of PowerPoint, I, um, including not giving up the directorship of creative writing at UC Davis for several years because I knew it meant that I was going to have to teach a 150 person class if I gave up the directorship oh, no. and then I was going to have to use PowerPoint. So really, <laughs> like my quality of life has been greatly affected by my fear of PowerPoint. <laughs> and I finally just gave my first PowerPoint presentation out at Pacific last week, and it turns out it's easy. <laughs> I guess, really. <laughs> but, but still, not necessarily about, um, you know, no great work has ever been made without the subconscious. No great story has ever been written without going into what Chris Merrill calls the forest of the not knowing and hanging out there until you want to puke. And, <laughs> um, you know, and, and, and it would be nice to think we can know, but, but we can't know. We can only try this and that. Right. I think one of your stories that's really great in terms of feeling like it's coming from that place uh, is from Cowboys Are My Weakness, How to Talk to a Hunter. Um, <laughs> I'd love for us to look at this. This is number one. Uh, yes, let's get those adverbs off of it. Yeah, get the adverbs out of the way. I love the way that you that, that dialogue works in this. And I think there's also something interesting to be said about um, the, the fact that this isn't actually technically dialogue in the beginning. You're talking about what somebody is saying. Mm -hmm. It's um, right. Annie Dillard talks about that. Speaking of rules, Alexander Chi talks about Annie Dillard giving him the rule of um, never use dialogue when it can be uh, summed up in narration. <laughs> um, and I, I love the way that you, you do lots of things here. There are two um, slides for this one. Uh, do you want to read this? Sure. A week before Christmas, you'll rent It's a Wonderful Life and watch it together, curled on your couch, faces touching. Then you'll bring up the word monogamy. <laughs> He'll tell you how badly he was hurt by your predecessor. He'll tell you he couldn't be happier spending every night with you. He'll say there's just a few questions he doesn't have the answers for. He'll say he's just scared and confused. 
Of course, this isn't exactly what he means. Tell him you understand. Tell him you are scared too. Tell him to take all the time he needs. Know that you could never shoot an animal and be glad of it. Your best female friend will say, you didn't tell him you loved him, did you? Don't even tell her the truth. <laughs> if you do, you'll have to tell her that he said this. I feel exactly the same way. <laughs> Your best male friend will say, didn't you know what would happen when you said the word commitment? But that isn't the word that you said. He'll say, commitment, monogamy, it all means just one thing. <laughs> So can you talk us through the writing of this? I mean, I know it's, this is a long sure. time ago, but I, I just love the way it works. <laughs> yes, it was such a long time ago. <laughs> it's like 1987. I, um, and, and I will say, um, I, you know, it's funny to look back at, at, I mean, everyone knows this book of mine, and everyone wants me to still be this naive, you know? And, uh, <laughs> and I'm not. Um, but I, but I was just telling a, a student of mine who wrote to me and said, I'm so embarrassed about Evelyn and who she was and who I was. This is her character, you know, her somewhat autobiographical character. And I said, well, you know, it's okay to be embarrassed by her, but you gotta kind of love her too because you didn't get to you without her. And I try to feel that way when I'm slightly embarrassed by this. Um, <laughs> so, so, so after that digression. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, on the first slide, you know, you had the, the, the what what we call indirect dialogue. You know, that mm -hmm. you that you list the um, I, I'm in I'm in the narrator's head um, reporting dialogue that has happened in the past. Now, why didn't I put that in direct dialogue? Um, I, I can't tell you the answer to that 26 years later. <laughs> but, but what I see when I look at this, I mean, the whole story is about, it, it, this story is really about its rhythm and about its cadences. So you have the story, which is told kind of this way, you know, the, these few days over Christmas. Uh, that's the arc of the story and the narrator finding out about another woman, this guy, this hunter is seeing, named Patty Coyote. And, um, <laughs> and, and, and so a lot of it's told that way, but then it's broken by uh, your best male friend, your best female friend, um, this is what you learned in college, this is what you learned in graduate school. So, right. so in this case, the story is really about the contrast, or this part of the story is about the contrast between this kind of summarized exposition, and then in the next slide, um, you know, time slows down and we're in actual direct dialogue and the best male friend and the female friend become sort of like the chorus watching, uh, watching the narrator like make a fool of herself with the hunter basically and they, they provide commentary throughout the story. So when I see these two passages, what I think is, or this one longer passage, I think of, well this is about the, again it's that song, you know, it's the beat of the story. So you have, you have a little, summary that includes the specifics of reported conversation and then and then time slows down and look at the sees where the reader can be right there mm -hmm. <laughs> and right down there um, the reader can come into the page and actually hear hear the the speaking right this one has such a great rhythm to it I mean it's mm -hmm. it really is it's musical it's poetic and um, and it, it does it creates this really um, I don't know extraordinary sort of music through the whole thing which I think you do so well in so many different ways. There's also um, Waltzing the Cat. Mm -hmm. This is number two, Tomas. This is from The Best Girlfriend You Never Had. Mm -hmm. Now this is three different people talking. Um, the mother, the father, and uh, Lucy O'Rourke, the main character. This is a novel in stories. Um, and it's, it's, this is a, a really great story. Um, so what's happening here is the, the mother and the father have been getting loaded all morning and now they're going through a drive, for a drive, and Lucy is driving, she gets pulled over. Yeah, and so is this the whole thing? This is the whole thing, okay. Uh, yeah, okay, to the end so, of the So scene. basically, they're in Carefree, Arizona. I, that's important to oh, me right. that you know that. They're in Carefree, because the father wanted to see the fountain that shoots all that air 250 feet high in the desert. Um, and so we're driving through Carefree, and 
And I say we, we'll just go ahead and say we. And um, <laughs> just really to make that <laughs> distinction at this point seems a little dishonest. Um, so, so we're driving through Carefree and, and I've gotten pulled over. We're in my car. And, and I've done like 37 things wrong. Like, so first, I, I rolled through a stop sign and I didn't put my turn signal on and I made a left turn from the center lane and then, and then I don't have my license on me because I'm in college in Ohio and this is Arizona and, and the cop says like almost hopefully, so are you wearing contact lenses? Because my license says I need glasses and I don't have glasses. So it's that moment basically and um, okay, so, so, so the cop's standing there basically. What I don't know, my father said, is how a person with so little sense of responsibility gets a driver's license in this country to begin with. He flicked the air vent open and closed, open and closed. I mean, you gotta wonder if she should even be let out of the house in the morning. <laughs> Why don't you just say it, Robert, my mother said. Say what you mean, say, daughter, I hate you. Her voice started shaking. Everybody sees it, everybody knows it. Why don't you, see it out? Why don't you say it out loud? And then, of course, the cop who was standing there witnessing all this says, you know, there's really nothing I could do to you today that's going to feel like punishment. So <laughs> you just uh, fasten your seatbelt and drive safely. Basically. <laughs> that's what happens after this. <laughs> I love this one. So how, um, I, I'm curious. Oh, there it how, is. Yeah, oh, I'm there. sorry. I thought more. we were done. Mm. Um, OK, I'm so sorry. Ms. O'Rourke, Officer Jenkins was back at the window. Let's hear it, my mother went on. Officer, I hate my daughter. <laughs> the cop's eyes flicked for a moment into the back seat. According to the information I received, Ms. O'Rourke, Officer Jenkins said, oh, see, I blew it. Officer Jenkins said, you were required to wear corrective lenses. That's right, I said. And you are wearing contacts now? There was something like hope in his voice. <laughs> no, sir. She can't even lie, my father said, about one little thing. Okay now, on three, my mother said, daughter, I wish you had never been born. Ms. O'Rourke, Officer Jenkins said, I'm just gonna give you a warning today. I, my father bit off the end of a laugh. Thank you very much, I said. I hate to say this, Ms. O'Rourke, the cop said, but there's nothing I could do to you that's gonna feel like punishment. <laughs> Um, and that's, I'm sorry I gave it away because I, I, I thought <laughs> there was only one slide. But, but anyway, yeah, this scene, um, again, I mean, for what it's worth, this scene comes from real life. And, uh, and the funny thing about this scene, uh-oh, uh that was me, sorry. <laughs> the, the funny thing about this scene is that I tried to put this scene in like four different stories. <laughs> And I tried to put it in, Cowboy, in, in the book, Cowboys Are My Weakness, in a couple of different stories. This is in the story in Waltz in the Pat, which came out years later. And my editor, uh, the great Carol Smith, said, you can't put that in there, it's too awful. And I said, no, it's funny, Carol. <laughs> and she said, no, it's awful, it's too awful. <laughs> and I said, no, no, it's funny. And we had this debate, um, Tree's laughing because she knows Carol. I, Carol was one of the greatest editors of all time who's ever lived, and she loved books more truly than anyone I've ever known. And, but she was feisty, and we would, and so was I, of course, and I was a kid, and she was in charge of me. And so we, <laughs> we fought all the time. And this was one of our biggest fights, was about this scene. And, uh, and anyway, and then, and then in the end I won. You know, years later, like I got to leave it here. But this particular scene, which, if you know the story of the best girlfriend you ever had, it's really a collage. It's built of lots of different little pieces. And mm -hmm. so, so this scene is like, this was a scene that was hanging around in my computer, like waiting for a home for a decade. Yeah. And it finally found a home in the story. Wow. I just think it's such a great example of what you were talking about uh, earlier tonight, about um, the way that dialogue can reveal character the way it reveals the tension between characters. Mm. We have really distinct voices here. Right. Um, the father's voice is completely clear. The mother's voice is totally clear. The officer has his own kind of, of almost avuncular um, 
a bit bemused, bewildered sort of voice, mm -hmm. um, and and Lucy or you mm -hmm. have has this um, very curt sort of like almost you're just hanging on surviving. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I just it's such a remarkable piece of writing. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm really proud of this piece and this scene. I mean, I, it's one of my favorite scenes that I've ever written. And it, it was given to me. I mean, this scene, just like the lady on the plane, it was given to me. <laughs> I was there. I was there <laughs> taking notes in my head. Um, and, and I was just sitting here thinking, I was looking at that last line where the cop says, there's nothing I could do to you today that feels like punishment. He can't have possibly said that. <laughs> I hope he did. Though. I hope he did too. I really There's do. no way to know now. <laughs> <laughs> so let's just say that he did. Let's decide that he did. <laughs> There's no way to know now. But, but I'm curious to know. Yeah. Um, so when you wrote this for Cowboys Are My Weakness, was it vastly different in that version? Did no. it change a lot? No. Um, you know, interestingly, the best girlfriend you never had, um, which which before contents may have shifted, was the best example of me doing exactly what I'm inclined to do, which right. is take all these little pieces and collage them. That's really who I am as a writer. And if the stories end up looking linear, it's because I have put all this time into sort of opposing what, what I would call a false linearity on them, because in my mind, it's all a collage. Yeah. Um, so this piece, like many of the pieces in that story, was you know, already lived in, in my computer. Do we have computers? Yeah, we had computers by the time of Waltzing the Cat. Um, but not for Cowboys or My Weakness. Um, anyway, uh, it lived in my computer in this file called Stuff, you know, or Junk or whatever. And, and they were just little mini scenes, which, which this story is, is composed of. And the frame on the story, which is a perfect day in the city, always starts like this. It's, it's a very false frame that's just trying to be a big basket that holds all these pieces. So, right. so this scene, dialogue heavy, obviously, um, oh, almost entirely dialogue, really, was, um, was, was a scene waiting for a home. Wow. I, I knew it was a good scene. I mean, I knew it was powerful, but I, but I couldn't convince Carol for a long time. Yeah, because that's funny, because it is both, it's awful, and it's very funny. It's awful, it's and both. it's very funny. It's absolutely true. And, you know, that's, um, you know, thank God for the marriage of pathos and humor. Right. Because it's how a lot of us, like, get up in the morning, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, but it also makes for good, uh, for good fiction. So in terms of the writing of this, would you say, do you, um, do you, do you type? Your, your scenes, or in order, do you get like a lot of speed going when you write dialogue, or do you write it painstakingly? How would you say that you craft something like this? Well, a lot of it is, you know, the first draft, it's just getting, I mean, often for me, it, it's about just getting down more or less what was said. Now, yeah. having said that, um, and this is a whole other kettle of fish, which we don't have to open, but you know, on the fiction, nonfiction question, I, I uh, you know, it, ha the thing happens, this is how it is for me. I don't know if it's this way for you or you, but, <laughs> or you, um, but, but the, you know, the thing happens, the thing of interest happens and I'm already making it better. You know, I, I'm already yeah. making it better before I get anywhere near the page. Like I'm already remembering it better. And, right. and by the time I actually take notes on it or get that first little impulsive, okay, that was really good dialogue, like the lady on the plane, let's right. say, like by the time I actually get it into my phone or whatever, like it's already a lot better. You know, I could never say that's how it really was because I don't know how it really was because I'm already making a story of it. So in this case with the guy, you know, the cop, well, there's no chance of ever knowing, you know, <laughs> no chance. I mean, and, and I mean, that was 30 years, you know, such a long time ago. But, um, but, but so, so that first initial writing down is just very fast. Like, just try to get it with the caveat, with the asterisk saying it's already improved. Right. Then it's about, you know, trimming it or, punching it or, you know, doing whatever to, you know, through drafts. And that part's really painstaking mm -hmm. for me. I mean, I do draft, I do 80 drafts, you know, I do a jillion drafts. So it's about tweaking it, yeah. right? 
But then most importantly, like finding what goes around it, finding how it sits with the exposition that is near it, mm -hmm. you know, and how that exposition can inform it and, um, you know, uh, kind of supercharge it. Right. Do you read it out loud when you're oh, writing yeah. it? Oh, yeah. Again and again and again. Yeah. So you get the rhythm. Totally. The rhythm to me it is more, almost more important than anything. It's certainly more important than the meaning. Yeah. So a lot of times I'll just fill in words that fill up a sentence because I want it to go ba 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 ba, you know, or whatever. Yeah. So I'll just fill in sort of nonsense words. I mean, not exactly nonsense words, but words that I know I'm going to change later, just to fill up the line, right. the rhythmic line. Right. Like like poetry. Yeah. Um, well, you brought up something that, uh, two things actually. So the collage style, obviously this is something that um, it, it works so beautifully for you and you've been doing it in all of these different ways from the beginning. Uh, contents may have shifted, of course, is, um, is like this is the a whole collage. <laughs> the entire thing is yeah. a collage. And even within each vignette, mm -hmm. there is collage. Mm -hmm. And um, so Tomas, can we put number four up, please? Um, so this, I, 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 I love this. This is so interesting in the way that you are juxtaposing um, different, such completely different things. And yet it, it, mm -hmm. it's so beautiful and it has this poetic sort of um, sense to it. Uh, so I'd love to chat about this for a minute. And also, again, this, this gets at um, the, the question of fiction and nonfiction because in contents may have shifted. The na it, this is technically fiction. We're calling it fiction, but the narrator's name is Pam. She's a writer and a writing teacher, um, and uh, and so this is this is a, there are a lot of things going on here, and it's great. Okay, so let's hear it. <laughs> um, all right. You must understand, he says, that I trusted the universe fully. I decided for the first time ever not to watch my back. I jumped in with both feet, and the universe let me down. I want to say. I think that only works vice versa. I want to say, what self-respecting universe would ever tell anybody not to watch his back? <laughs> I want to say, none of this would make any sense without suffering. What I do say is, it would be a pity if Sophie's enticing you into sticking your dick in her became evidence against the universe's <laughs> benevolent nature. <laughs> but what if truth is a woman? reads a single line chapter in Cliff Parker's manuscript. And I wrote in the margin, if it is, it isn't this woman. <laughs> <laughs> that cracks me up. <laughs> um, so what are we talking about? Well, <laughs> several things, several things. So I, I love that we have um, essentially the subtext here. So you're, you're making the subtext clear to the reader. Mm -hmm. um, I love that then it ends with this, this, this disconnect, this juxtaposition of then all of a sudden we're in you editing Cliff Parker's uh -huh. manuscript uh -huh. and the dialogue is, is in writing basically. It's between right. his manuscript and, and your response. Right. Um, so I, in terms of the collage idea, like how, how do you well, make the leap? How do you well, one thing I, I would, one thing that this is a good <laughs> example of is sort of exactly what I said not to do. <laughs> it's another one of those in my, in my craft talk. Like, this is real emotional contextualization, that middle paragraph. Sure. But you see how I've gotten away with it, or I think I've gotten away with it. You see how I've gotten away with it by, for one thing, by being funny. Funny, yeah, right? exactly. And, and the little bit of surprise. Like, I'm not saying, like that bad dial dialogue I wrote about, the right. guy who doesn't like the woman's cooking. Right. Like, I'm not saying exactly what the reader expects, right? Right. I'm sort of saying, hopefully, what the reader doesn't expect. And in that case, like, you know, we always say, show, don't tell, show, don't tell, show, don't tell. We say that until we're blue in the face. But of course, like many things with writing, it's not what we mean. Um, we don't mean show, don't tell. You know, we mean something like show, 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 and then tell effectively, you know? And, and, right. and with telling, you know, you can tell as long as you're telling what the reader is not expecting you to tell. The thing where you get into trouble is if you're telling what the reader already knows, basically, which is 90% of the telling in manuscripts and in a lot of published books. Um, so, so in this case, hopefully, the things I am revealing here are not what the reader expects to hear. And 
the collage form, especially the extremeness of the collage form mm -hmm. in Contest May Have Shifted, makes me allowed to tell a little. In fact, it requires it because the reader's always slightly off balance by the change of scenes. Mm -hmm. And then, just in case I've bored anyone with the first half of that paragraph, <laughs> like I come in with the big line to hopefully, you know, make them forget that I just emotionally contextualized by cracking them up. Right, right. Aren't I great? <laughs> <laughs> this well is so done. weird. This is so weird to be like, oh, and then I did this other really smart thing, and then I made another smart decision. <laughs> oh, you've earned it. Okay, well then let's talk about somebody else for a minute. Let's talk about Hemingway. But oh, well, just let me say oh, one yeah? thing about. I'm sorry. No. Just let me say a little one, more about me. A little more about me. <laughs> one thing about Cliff Parker. I mean, that's a big leap there, obviously, because we're not even talking about Cliff Parker. Cliff Parker comes back several times in the book, and I'm editing his. Man Pam is at, Pam, the character named Pam, is editing Cliff Parker's manuscript, and and so you know about this this idea about truth and like C Cliff Parker, like Rick, who's the guy in the scene, is totally smitten with a a kind of a, a woman who mistreats him. So they have that in common. And then, and so, so, so anyway, this idea of truth being a woman is, is throughout the book. So <laughs> I felt like I could, it, it's just a little downbeat that comes in occasionally, this idea of truth. And then eventually Pam meets truth, the woman who is a, um, a genius at a Mac store in, uh, in Sacramento <laughs> and, uh, and she's a real bitch. Um, but, but anyway, it's true, it's true. <laughs> um, so yeah, Tomas, if we could have number five. This is, uh, this is Hemingway mm -hmm. from The Sun Also Rises. You want me to read or you want to read it? You read it. All right. We unwrapped the little parcels of lunch. Chicken. There's hard-boiled eggs. Find any salt? First the egg, said Bill, then the chicken. Even Brian could see that. He's dead. I read it in the paper yesterday. No, not really. Yes, Brian's dead. Bill laid down the egg he was peeling. Gentlemen, he said, and unwrapped a drumstick from a piece of newspaper. I reversed the order, for Brian's sake, as a tribute to the great commoner. First the chicken, then the egg. Wonder what day God created the chicken. Oh, said Bill, sucking the drumstick. How should we know? We should not question. Our stay on earth is not for long. Let us rejoice and give thanks. Eat an egg. <laughs> and who did, and, and, and you know, where did Cormac McCarthy come from? Right. I mean, you can see it so clearly. Exactly. What I found interesting about this one um, was that basically, it, Tomas, can you go back to the beginning of this one? Mm -hmm. That you see everything through the dialogue. Right. You can see the action. You don't, he, he doesn't have to do any, any work at all. So it's, it's very much like what you're saying with, with McCarthy. Right. No, it's so, I mean, this frame especially is so much, I mean, it even looks like it on the page. But it's that, you know, we're going to avoid the real subject, we're going to avoid the real subject, we're going to avoid the real subject, we're going to sneak it in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's really startling, along with that Cormac scene. I mean, it's even the same. It's like the food is the distraction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was thinking that's just a really interesting way to structure uh, the action, essentially. Well, yeah, I mean, and that in, in, in the Cormac and in this, in a lot of Hemingway, you know, famously, Hills Like White Elephants. It's not a craft talk till somebody says Hills right. Like White Elephants. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know. Oh, my God. Is that me? You? I don't know. I'm not moving. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's almost like a play, right? I mean, it's almost like a play, except there's no people putting the emotion in their bodies. Right. So every so so the onus is so on the reader to provide it. Right. And you know, some people like that and some people don't. You know, it's not it's not like the ultimate goal is to have no other words on the page. Right. At least not my ultimate goal. But it is it it it's powerful if you read Hemingway or if you read Carver or if you read Cormac just and that scene of Toni Morrison, which I like the best of all, to just to see how much work dialogue can do if press to do right. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. I think I've got one more that I want to ask you about. Oh, yeah. Do you have number three, Tomas? So in a little more about me, so a little bit more about me, or a little more about me is um, 
Pam's collection of essays, and, and um, it's from years of, of writing for newspapers and magazines. Um, it's a lot of fun. And this, this is not, oh, oh yeah, this is it. Um, so I, I like this in terms of seeing the way, the, the dynamic between the therapist and, and you in terms of um, gesture. Because I was thinking about dialogue, you know, oftentimes gesture substitutes for words in terms of um, egging somebody on or shutting somebody down. That's not, a, uh, so I, I like the way the therapist sort of keeps the, the truth moving uh -huh. in this uh -huh. one. Uh -huh. Wanna read it? Sure. It's strange, I will say tentatively, but it seems like I've been trying to save that airport scene more than any other. My therapist will get the stifled smile on his face that he reserves for moments just before a major breakthrough. And why do you think that would be, he will say. And then the truth will wash over me and I will sit in his office and I won't be able to stop grinning. Because there is value in the sadness, I will say, and his smile will be really uncontainable now. <laughs> it can fill you up, I will say, and I will mean it, like happiness can, only in a different way. Oh, that's so sentimental, it makes me sweat. Um, <laughs> I forgot all about that. I don't even know what airport scene he's talking about. But, um, but so yeah, I mean obviously, obviously <laughs> the only possible, uh, the only good thing in this, <laughs> in this oh. section <laughs> is the therapist who provides a little humor, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, who, um, and who is there to acknowledge that I am having therapy 101 right. here, right? Right, exactly. And so his kind of straight man, obvious straight man, is letting the reader know that I know that I just had step breakthrough number one of therapy right. 101. Right. right, yeah, no, that's right. That's how that's working. The funniest thing happened at my therapist the other day. Um, <laughs> I, I, had a, I had a friend who, um, came to visit me this summer and acted very meanly toward me for many days. And, um, <laughs> and anyway, so I was talking to him about it. And I said, uh, and he said, well, what are you, you going to do? And, and, and I don't hardly see my therapist anymore. This is the guy that like made me better, like who got me, had, did EMDR, like the whole thing, a decade of hard, hard work. But now I only see him like, if there's a Bronco, Broncos game, like sometimes he'll text me. Oh, I wasn't supposed to say Broncos. Um, I forgot. I was going to bring that up. I forgot. Um, I wasn't supposed to say Broncos. Oh, well. So, like, if they're, if they're, he's in Denver. Uh, and, and if I happen to be at a Broncos game, that, but he'll text me and he'll be like, the Broncos are in town. Are you in town? You want to come by? Like, that's how we now see each other um, for therapy. Uh, clear, I want to make that clear. Anyway, so I'm, I'm having therapy with him for, like, the first time in six months, and so I'm telling him this thing about when my friend came and treated me really meanly. And, um, and he goes, well, what, what do you think you should do? And I said, I said, well, I don't know, you know, but it seems like I should just walk away. Do you think? And he goes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and we both just cracked up. <laughs> We cried. He goes, "Oh, I guess I should have asked you back again." It was so funny. It was so funny. I just love that moment. I gotta write that. It was so beautiful. If I could get the writing right, it was so beautiful. He goes, "Absolutely!" Like he was just a normal person. <laughs> anyway, it's great. Oh, I love it. Well, on that note, why don't we open up the, 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 the questions to the therapist in the audience. If any of you have any questions, I think we can, yeah, let's open the mic up a little bit. Um, yeah. Well, this is not about dialogue, but in your book, Pockets Made of Tissues, mm -hmm. uh, we are always very much in oriented in geography. Yes. We know where we are in place. Yes. But I haven't noticed really any uh, references to time. Uh -huh. Here, so it must have been a deliberate choice. Sure, yes. Um, I mean, place, I mean, just to say briefly, you know, for me, like, place is almost always where the story comes from. I mean, sometimes it's things that happen in the place, but 
but, but I'm a very place-oriented person. And so the book is obviously intentionally organized to uh, have places as, as the mile markers. As for time, um, I, I'm purposely, uh, you know, we, there's a thing that's said a lot these days in academia, which is, oh, it was okay, competent realism. <laughs> it's the big, it's the big, it's the big slap. Yeah, it was a pretty good book. Eh, competent realism. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, you, there's so many books. <laughs> Speaking of counterexamples, let's think of all the books that would fall into that category. Uh, almost every book, you know, for several centuries. But um, so, so competent realism. So, but, but my quarrel with that, my quarrel with the, uh, the condescending nature of it is obvious. But the other quarrel I have with it is, like, realism. Like, for me... Realism is not, rea reality is not this happened, then 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 this happened, which is basically what they mean. It's like a book, a, a good story well told. That's what they mean by competent realism. For me, time is a real question. I mean, just if, I mean, I, I, I don't, you know, I don't know the physics or, I mean, I can't have this conversation in an intelligent way except to tell you <laughs> that my gut feeling about time is to be very suspicious of it. So, and, and for me, real, reality is, is these, these glimmering, shocking, alarming, impressive, beautiful, fill in the adjective moments that arrest my attention and make me want to write them down. So, so my life is really about amassing those. And my reality is about sort of sitting it, it, inside my own head while those glimmers um, pop around together. And where they happened in time is really much less important to me than how they speak to each other. And that's what Contents May Have Shifted is trying to do. Contents May Have Shifted is not just a collage because I like collage, although that's one reason. It's because for me, reality is really about this, this moment I'm having you know, in a Seattle coffee shop, which takes me back to a, a long time ago when I came to Seattle and, and um, you know, went to the Sam Sculpture Garden the first year it was open to another time that I was in a sculpture garden in Nuremberg, you know, et cetera. I mean, I'm not doing a very good job of this, and I'll just tell you why. I got up at 3.30 to leave my ranch to <laughs> drive to the airport, so I'm starting to lose language. But, but, I, but, <laughs> but, but you get the gist of it. I mean, for me, I was trying to represent what, what being alive, what reality is for me. And for me, that's all about the past intruding on the moment, sometimes in a great way, sometimes in a dangerous way. It's all about my fear for the future, intruding on this moment I'm having, like especially the really good ones, especially the moments where I'm like, oh, this is so good, oh, this is so good, this is so good, and then it's like, oh my God, we're all gonna die, right? <laughs> like that's, you know, it, reality for me is that. It, time is wobbly, the way it elongates, and the way it compresses. I, I, I'm, not, I'm just not sure I believe in it as a marker. Whereas place, on the other hand, feels very solid to me. Not unchangeable, just, just the earth feels solid, like I trust it in a way that I don't trust time. Questions? Yeah, here. Yeah, I can I can see that. I mean, I can hear that. You mean? Are you talking about just so I'm clear, like the guy who I trusted the universe? Or are you talking about how to the how to talk to a hunter? Mm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, probably. I hope so. I hope I knew that much. You know, in my own mind, 
when I was writing Cowboys and My Weakness, like I vomited up those stories and had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> Th though I, though, though I, you know, I, I revised them a lot. <laughs> you know, I, I don't mean to, I, I revised them, you know, for years. I, I don't mean to say, like, but to me, they came the way a first book often does in this, like, puking, hurling rush. <laughs> and all the other books have just had a lot more, like, I, I just had a sense, a little more sense each time of who I was as a writer and what I was doing. Whereas, Cowboys are my weakness. I was in grad school. I was just trying to get the assignment done. You know, I, I like I don't. I I, I knew so little, uh, which you know could, could be good. You know, sometimes it's good to to know little, but but I don't. It's just been too many years for me to say for sure. But that seems right. What you're saying. Anyone? I meant it in a nice way. No, it was better for you. And how, like, how do you navigate that? Like, when you say, "Oh my God, I held on to this theme that I knew was important for ten years." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As a writer, wow, I mean, that's a big thing to hear another writer say. Mm -hmm. I mean, filled with faith and all these funny nuances that, they, and then when I listen to writing, and it's a the way it's collaged together. I mean, I can imagine you writing these themes, and you told the story about the vodka bottle with the rose. Mm -hmm. And you knew that was important, but it was a long time for you mm -hmm. why, and you kind of pushed for it. Can you just talk about that, that intuitive part that clicked, or almost clicked, or because yeah. that kind of thing? Well, for me, when I'm writing, it, it's when I'm when I'm starting when when I'm trying to get the scenes and trying to take these glimmers that I've written down and bring them together. It's a real game. I mean, if I'm really honest about it, it, it's a game of like trying to know and not know at the same time. I mean, I, I, I wish I could say something more definitive, but it's like, well, I, 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 I believe in my gut feelings about a certain, a certain glimmer, let's say, but I don't want to know too much about it because if I know too much about it, I'm going to try to overdetermine its meaning on the page or I'm going to put it with other glimmers that insist on it in some way that will make even me roll my eyes, not to mention the reader. So, so for me, it's really about like not saying what does it mean, you know, not saying what does it mean. Eventually, I can't ignore what it means, but I try to keep that out and try to trust this feeling of resonance, which brought me to the glimmer in the first place. Like that scene with the cop, you know, two things about it. Like it was so powerful and, and so funny and such a perfect representation of my childhood mm. that like in a way I knew too much about it. And maybe that's why I kept putting it in the wrong place. Whereas um, like, oh gosh, I'm trying to think of something I read to you tonight. Um, Okay, like the, the Pentecostals from Floyd Data. That's a really good example. The Pentecostals from Floyd Data, like I didn't know if that really meant anything to me or if you just, I love the words, you know, five naked Pentecostals from Floyd Data. And so I, would, I was gonna like put it in there and just it, it, its meaning would take care of itself later in the book because it sounded so good, you know? And so everything falls somewhere on that continuum, but not knowing in a sense, is a condition, trying not to know at least, is a condition of putting these objects together into the collage and hoping that the meaning will kind of distill up out of them like Jack Daniels. And the less I can have my hands directly in that process, the better for as long as I can. And then eventually in revision, I, I probably know everything, or not everything, because sometimes reviewers tell me things about stories that I didn't get myself. <laughs> um, which is a nice feeling. It, it makes me feel like I'm doing something right. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. We got anybody else? Right here. Yeah, you. Hi. Sorry, you can't believe how bright these lights are. <laughs> <laughs> so I know a lot of people here are in writing, fiction writing classes and speech fiction writing classes, and there's a lot about the story arc of the media. Mm -hmm. You know, with the, you know, you have to have an inciting incident, then your rising action, and your climax, and all that stuff. Your, yeah, I know, so I'm, I'm curious both as a writer and a teacher what your feelings about that because, of course, you're writing like. 
Yeah, I have a feeling about that. You know, the, the, the story. <laughs> Surprise. Um, I, the story arc, okay, it, it exists whether we want it to or not. I mean, that's what I learned with, with Contents May Have Shifted, interestingly. I had a real relationship with the story arc because when I was doing all that collaging and hanging out with all those grad school theory brains, I was saying things to myself like, there is no meaning. Not only is there no time, there is no meaning. And we never learn anything. And life is all about, anyway, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> and so when I wrote the first few chapters, or when I, when I wrote the first few drafts, I was really my object was to deny the story arc, was to say, I will not have a story arc because I don't believe in Freytag's pyramid or whatever it is. I, I you know, I, I do not believe in rising action. I, I was, I was, I was making some kind of point, which is, you know, a lot of what we're doing as writers all the time is making some kind of point. It, it would turn out to be a stupid point and, and, and an irrelevant <laughs> point, and also not something I believe ultimately. And by the time I lived with that book for five years, revision, 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 organizing for, I had so many different rules. Talk about rules. I couldn't have two international destinations in any group of 12. I couldn't put mm -hmm. any uh, Western states next to each other. I, like I had so many rules because you know rules, like you know rules are these lies we tell ourselves to make us feel sane, which is which is cool. Um, <laughs> but but by the time I got, by the time I got, I had lived with her for five years, I understood that the story arc is there. It's there. You know, it's there whether we. It's like air, you know, it's there whether we acknowledge it or not because the story begins and the story ends. And the reader starts reading here and stops reading here. So they're on an arc no matter what we want, <laughs> you know, no matter how much we want to deny it, the arc is going to be there. Additionally, I realized, you know, I'm not a nihilist after all. And, <laughs> and I wanted Pam, the character, to learn and grow and get somewhere. So then it was about balancing those two things. It was about balancing my desire to represent reality as I understand it, as I described earlier, you know, this broken thing, this sort of broken and beautiful thing that isn't necessarily chronological or logical, and the fact that it was going to be a book and it was going to be bound between two covers and Pam started somewhere and where did I want her to end up? And so I, over time, I would say I let that sleeping dragon of narrative arc just rise a little in my organization. And there's a rough chronology in the book. And hopefully Pam knows more at the end than she does at the beginning, though she's not sure. That's how I worked it out. Let's see, anybody who hasn't asked a question? Okay, over here. Oh, sure. <laughs> um, maybe we should make this the this last, be the last one. one yeah. <laughs> um, it, it's not like I'm not having fun, but it, we've been here a long time, um, and and I am I'm sort of losing words. Uh, I want to say something good though, because I feel really strongly about this. Um, I'm, I'm a sort of natural confessor, you've noticed. Um, and I, I don't have the same sort of inhibitions about talking ab about ways I've screwed up that a lot of people I know do. So maybe, maybe I'm lucky that way, you know. Um, but I do understand you know, really well that, that, you know, there's nothing a reader likes less than a perfect character. You know, <laughs> you know we, we, we love each other, we come to know each other, we come to trust each other because we see the flaws in each other. And, um, you know, I have never read a book where someone admitted their mistakes or, or was vulnerable 
where I then said, oh, this person's too vulnerable. I don't want to know <laughs> them or read this book or be their friend. You know, I mean, that, that, you know, we're so afraid of it, but it also seems ridiculous to be afraid of it. So, you know, uh, Terry Tempest Williams says in Refuge, the place that makes us vulnerable is the place that makes us strong. And, and I believe that, you know, I believe that. So for me, you know, writing is about risk taking. It's about risk taking. That's what it is. That's, I mean, it's decision making and risk taking. That's what writing is. And so it's like, how, well, are you willing? Are you willing to go there? Are you willing to look at that? And the answer better be yes. You know, it better be yes all the time. You know, and if it takes you a while to work up to yes, that's all right. But, um, you know, all of the best writing is about pushing on the bruise. Where does it hurt? Does it hurt there? Well, let me push on it a little harder. Does it hurt there? You know, that's what it is. And, um, and you know, that it's not just about the, the trauma. It's also, like I said, about like, like the beauty and like loving the world so much and realizing, you know, it's all going to be over soon and all of that, you know, like all of that, you know. And so I tell my students, I say, you know, you don't want to write first drafts with your, with your analytical brain. Your analytical brain is helpful. It's helpful in life and it's also helpful in revision. But that those early drafts, I think, should be written with what I think of as the screaming brain. The screaming brain that says, we're all going to die. Everyone we love is going to die. You know, and a lot of shitty things are going to happen between now and then. You know, that's, that's, the, that's who you want to go to the computer with. You know, that person. I think that's right. <laughs> it's a perfect that, way to end. Yeah, yeah, excellent. <laughs>